Today is October 3rd, and it's approximately 11.02 a.m. Um, this is public meeting number 535 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. I'm Jordan Maynard, and I'm serving as interim chair. Uh, because we are here in person, we don't have to do a roll call, which is fine. Um, and um, am I missing anything? So we are now officially open to meeting this. Um, I want to take this time to uh, thank Mass Hire, and I want to thank Cindy Chapin, uh, Chapin um, who's a friend of our friend, uh, Lisa Brookner, at the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. And uh, we just really, it humanizes. We get these packets, right, that are already put together. Our team back here, they put together these wonderful packets. They sit through all these meetings. They make all these decisions on how these grants should move forward. Um, but by the time it hits the gaming commissioners, right, we often don't know uh, much about the background except what's in there, right, legally what we're required to know. This puts a face. This humanizes the dollars that we spend. And so now when these applications come in, I know exactly where the money's going from, or coming from. And so I do have to say, I was talking to Chris before, and Chris said that he was really excited to have us here today, and we're really excited uh, to be here. So uh, with that said, um, thank you for having us. Thank you for allowing us to learn. And I do want to um, welcome, and we're gonna go to item number two on the agenda. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Chris and, and uh, however, Chris and Chris. Do you want to do it. Chris is Neil Lee. He's the president and CEO of Mass High Central North Forest for the Vinny Association. She's our chief operating officer. Uh, thanks, Jordan. So I'll have to make comments brief because um, really while we're the great recipients uh, of the Workforce Development Grant through the Community Education Fund, really it's all the partners who you saw a couple this morning, we will hear from the others uh, in just a few minutes. That's really where the work gets done, uh, on the ground, and there's no organizations who are on the ground, uh, recruiting students, giving them training, helping them uh, get basic to jobs. And so those are the folks that I really want to highlight uh, today. Uh, we started this regional consortium back in 2017, before the casino was there. While the consortium has changed over the years and, and developed it, uh, in different ways, the ultimate goal has always been the same, and that's been to invest in the local communities who are most impacted by uh, the casino, and particularly around workforce development, creating that pipeline to those uh, good hospitality jobs at the casino as well as other hospitality employees around the area. And that's always been our, uh, our primary goal. And so the two program visits this morning and the other partners here today will talk a little bit about uh, how they try to accomplish that for residents all across uh, the greater Boston area. So. Um, with that, I will turn it over to our COO, Penny Estelle. She's going to talk a little bit about some of the outcomes and numbers, uh, which really kind of highlight the importance of these programs and the importance of continuing to invest uh, in these types of programs in the future, um, and really highlighting the great outcomes and impact we have on the local communities that we're all trying to serve together. So, uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you for our host, IANE, BCNC, this morning. Um, and so, Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I wanted to actually highlight the critical role the Community Mitigation Fund has had with helping the labor market recover, um, particularly in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, over the past seven years, this fund has been unlike mine for our partner organizations. It's been funding job training programs that address labor market challenges in the region, and the hospitality industry, as you know, was particularly one of the hardest hit industries um, of the pandemic. And there are a lot of businesses that are still struggling um, with those staffing shortages, and this grant really helps fill that gap. We train folks to become housekeepers, we train folks to work with um, culinary and chefs, uh, frontline customer service, we have programs to contextualize the DSOL. Um, and then in front of you, you also have an impact report, which really just summarizes some high-level 
outcomes and numbers of this grant, particularly for the last couple of years. And really, the numbers don't lie. Through these programs, in just the last two years, over 1,000 people have obtained employment. And of those 1,000 people, 518 placements actually completed which contributed to um, more, more sustainable access to careers for our workers and a stronger regional economy. So without further investment in the community mitigation fund, we lose this essential support. Um, so the potential fallout of not continuing to fund, invest in this fund is uh, a disruption of recovery of the hospitality industry. So I urge the commission to um, continue to advocate for the continued investment of this fund um, as it remains a key driver of workforce development. Um, so Metro North does run this grant in partnership with the City of Boston. So I'm going to now um, pass it over to Rashad Hill from the City of Boston, Deputy Chief of Work. Thanks so much, um, Kenny, uh, Penny, and Chris. Uh, and good morning to all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, I do have some notes. Um, I'm just going to read through just to highlight the City of Boston. So, support uh, of continued investment in the community mitigation fund. Uh, on behalf of Katie Ball, uh, who is our director of grants, I'm here with the Office of Workforce Development and our chief of worker economy cabinet, Trent Nguyen. I um, just want to express our strong support for sustained investment in the community mitigation fund. Um, with the city of Boston, we do believe that it is crucial um, that all residents in Boston and the broader region have access to quality training and job opportunities across all sectors, um, with an emphasis today on the hospitality industry. Investing in this sector um, is an investment in the strength, the vibrancy, and the growth of our economy. It also supports the development of a skilled workforce really helping to build a talent pipeline for the employers um, that we do the work. Our Mayor Michelle Wu set up the Worker Empowerment Cabinet to enhance the lives of workers in both the public and the private sector, with the goal to create a resilient and an inclusive workforce system that supports all Boston workers. As noted by Chris and Penny, as well as um, we'll hear from some of our partners today, the Community Mitigation Fund directly aligned with this vision. Um, this fund, um, as we're learning, um, has been crucial in supporting workforce training and in industries connected to the casino operations, particularly in impacted communities that we see across Boston. The impact on Boston workforce development is significant. The, in addition to the 750000 allocated by the Gaming Commission to help maintain CMF-supported initiatives, the City of Boston has also, um, has, uh, which should be noted, um, has been able to leverage the funding by directly supporting some of the CMF organizations, such as NECAP, BCMC, YMCA, as well in community service also. Um, we know that many organizations, not just with this funding, but with other funding streams as well, um, bring together um, different sources of dollars to serve constituents effectively. Um, they provide holistic wraparound support and remove barriers to ensure full participation without interruption, um, which is true nature. Um, and we thank our partners um, for their continued creativity and flexibility to open doors of opportunity. The City of Boston's investment in the Community Mitigation Fund, um, it aligns with the goals and helps us address labor market demands while continuing to promote economic inclusion. So this is important um, for many folks within the city um, that could not be here with us today. Um, we do support the engagement of our fellow and local representatives and senators um, who are allies in workforce development in our region, particularly those representing the CMF host communities to restore the funding to long-term sustainability. The fund is necessary, um, as we understand, 
for critical workforce development initiatives and community projects to remain unaffected and negatively impact the Boston's economic future if they are affected in the lives of countless residents. Um, so we all can continue to work together to advocate um, for the future of this fund. Um, the city of Boston thanks you guys and you know, thanks the entire, again, commission uh, for your partnership as we continue to work together. So thank you so much for your work. Thank you so much for your partnership, and thank you so much for your attention and your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we can hear from Ari Sylvia, the apprenticeship director for Best Hospitality. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Brought a handout for you. Oh, thank you. As Cindy said, my name is Lori Sylvia. I'm the Apprenticeship Director at Best Hospitality Training. And thank you so much for the opportunity to tell you about the impact the Community Mitigation Fund has on BEST, our community members, and the hotel industry. BEST has two sides of the house. We provide training, training services to community members who need new skills to enter the hotel industry through our job seeker programs. We're also the education provider for Unite Here Local 26, which is the Hospitality Workers Union here in Greater, Greater Boston. Our incumbent worker classes include English for Hospitality, U.S. Citizenship Preparation, Computers, Skills-Specific Training, and Hospitality Industry Credential that are recognized by the industry. And those are such as tips training, serve safe food handler, serve safe food manager. Since 2018, the Community Mitigation Fund has enabled us to support 284 diverse community members, mainly through our job seeker program. However, during the pandemic, when the hospitality industry was severely affected and hotel workers were laid off, the fund allowed us to offer these displaced workers English for Hospitality and technology courses, along with COVID safety in the workplace and career readiness workshops, preparing them to re-enter the industry when the hotels reopened. This year, the Community Mitigation Fund is supporting two of our job seeker programs, the Introduction to Hospitality Housekeeping Pre-Apprenticeship Program and our new Culinary Training Program. Both programs were designed and are offered in partnership with our hotel employer partners including Encore Boston Harbor. And in the handout that I just gave out to you, you'll see a couple of things. In the pictures, you'll see our students touring the casino, as well as one of our clients working as a lobby attendant. Graduates of the Introduction to Hospitality Housekeeping Pre-Apprenticeship Program earn a certificate from the Massachusetts Department of Labor Division of Apprentice Standards. And they also earn nine credits at Bunker Hill Community College in their hospitality program. After completing a 2,000 hour apprenticeship, they receive an apprenticeship completion certificate and then three additional college credits for a total of 12 college credits. In FY24, 472 people applied for this program. With public and private funding, including the Community Mitigation Fund, best served 68 job seekers. 74% of those came to best unemployed, and 83 of them relied on public assistance. After taking our program, I'm happy to report that 89% of them graduated and 81% of them secured a union hotel job with an average wage of $28.20 per hour, including <laughs> For these 68 individuals and their families, this has been life-changing. And we do, accept, we do expect similar outcomes for our, our new culinary training program. Additional workforce development investment would empower BEST and our community partners to further strengthen the hospitality sector, as well as create opportunities for all members of our communities. To truly showcase the profound impact this funding has on our community, I invite you to meet one of BEST's outstanding graduates, Sotali Latif. Her story exemplifies the life-changing difference the support makes in the lives of individuals we serve. So,
And last February, I graduated from the best introduction to hospitality and housekeeping pre apprenticeship program. So, let me tell you about my transformation. A year ago, I was a recent arrival from Haiti, a limited English, limited resources. And my husband and I were renting room from France. Uh, as you know, I was worried constantly about disturbing them. And I was working two jobs. One of them was a retail job for $15 a night with no benefits. I was in a position where I did whatever my employer asked me. Uh, I worked the cash register, I had clothes, I sweep the floor, everything you, you know they, they do at the, the, the store. I worked hard, but got a very small paycheck. So we were struggling. Today, I'm a proud local 26 housekeeper at the Maxi Hotel. <laughs> As Rose said, I am earning more than $28 per hour with full benefits. My husband and I did rent a beautiful apartment everything in the apartment we bought it ourselves and that uh, no one tell uh, no one helped us <laughs> we even bought a car we made a lot of progress we living our life a simple decent life and we're happy so how did the best training help create the new me this class helped <laughs> us everything we needed to become skilled housekeepers at a luxury hotel my classmates and I earned certificates in OSHA housekeeping safety and North Star digital literacy. You could have gone to college for these things, but we learned them in six weeks. Can you imagine? I didn't pay anything. You understand. <laughs> I will sure never take it for granted. We also learned how to interview for a job. For example, I learned the importance of small talk. When we get there, we, we talk to each other for a little while. And I learned that during an interview, you may be stressed, you may be stressed, but I learned that small talk can be a good way to get the attention of the interviewer. We learned how to respond to difficult questions with confidence. This was a huge benefit for me. And another thing we learned was how to provide above and beyond guest service. We took turns acting out being a difficult guest <laughs> and, and being the housekeeper. We loved that it, yeah. <laughs> we loved about the role plays right in class. But now at my job at the Muxy, I am grateful I learned how to calm down <laughs> <laughs> and make the guests feel comfortable and feel heard. My teachers taught me to not take it personally because as, as usual, in general, the guests don't stay. <laughs> they will move on. And uh, in the class, we also learned the importance of teamwork. At the Maxi, where I work, my coworkers finish. When they finish all their rooms, they help me, and I do the same, I help them. I guess the best way to prove you that best prepared me well for that job, that I, when I finished getting a room, a messy, a really messy room, I look around and say, oh my God, <laughs> it looks so great. And uh, always my supervisor praises me. I get along with everyone. Last week, a guest stopped me in the hallway to ask if I would be, clean, be cleaning her room the next day. She wanted to make sure that I received the tip she wanted to give me because she liked my work. And I'm really proud. Um, I take pleasure doing my job because I realized the importance of the role. Best made me realize uh, housekeeping is not about cleanliness. And without us, the hotel would be in, in, function, in function. We are the heart of the hotel. 
if we didn't go and do, do a good job, we just would come back. We would not come back. And we workers, we wouldn't have ours. I also know that if I ever want to move into another position at a hotel, people will respect me for having this housekeeping experience because actually I know the field. And uh, my husband and I are really grateful that we are stable now, I can tell. My family back home see me on Zoom, on WhatsApp, and uh, I can tell that they will be prayed for this. And I appreciate that the union make makes these jobs. We get paid well, and we get great benefits. Right now, I'm taking English classes with at best, and uh, as part of my education benefits. And last week, I took a CPR class. I passed. <laughs> Someday, my husband and I would like to buy a house using the, the union's first time home buyer loan. Most of all, my work comes with dignity. Our union makes sure we live as full human beings. Uh, so, actually, it's the end. Today, I'm happy to do the best I can at my job. We are saving and looking forward to our future. That's how life works. Uh, you want something, you work for it. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to work for a better life to this program. And ciao. Great success story, right? Yes. Um, and now we're going to hear uh, Action for Equity. Uh, Tashe Green Williams is the Deputy Director. Welcome, Tashe. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name, hello, my name is Tisha Green Williams, and I'm the Deputy Director of Action for Equity. I have written down some words because I kind of want to tell a story of how this all kind of started up and how the community was involved in the process. Um, so we are a coalition based in the Boston area um, and, and the communities of color. La Comunidad I think, from Everett anchored our history of advocacy and sits on our steering committee. Um, we want to thank you for the continuing support from the Gaming Commission and the Mitigation Fund. We also want to thank you for the leadership that the state showed in drafting the legislation and the commission showed in setting the requirements for the license and the workforce plan. Gaming was always intended to create an economic benefit for the residents of the Commonwealth and not just pull our money from people and give it to casino companies. We spent years as part of the community, community advocacy effort to shape the initial license requirements in Region A, and then the workforce plan with significant diversity requirements. We led the statewide effort and supported by the commission and casinos to modify the background check requirements to open up these good quality jobs to residents who were returning citizens. But then we found that Encore could not meet the hiring requirements. Because they were not in touch with our residents, they didn't know how to make it clear what they were offering. Top leadership at Encore during startup said, the, the jobs will be good. Isn't that good enough information for you? And our residents said, I don't want to make the boss I have now upset by applying for another job if I don't what they will know what they will pay. Another resident said, I need to know what the shifts are, if they're stable, I can't be changing shifts all the time. Another asked, what's the policy on tattoos? So there were a lot of things that people didn't know or understand about the jobs that they needed to know in order to make these decisions. We built the first pilot of our community pipeline to quality jobs and reached over 2,000 residents of color across Greater Boston. By name, 800 residents were hired who would not have been otherwise because they would not have known about the opportunity. We have maintained and expanded our community pipeline program ever since, in part with the mitigation fund funding. We are continuing to connect disconnected residents to quality jobs that they would not know about otherwise. We have also met with Encore and a committee of returning citizens and residents to ask about the employer-based background checks and go beyond the state and commission's requirement. This is a part of a larger effort to connect people with employees to quality jobs beyond district entry. 
he believed the mitigation fund is part of the funding infrastructure of the gaming industry that allows the industry to meet the economic goals built into the law to achieve the value-based purposes as was intended. We ask that the mitigation fund and the gaming commission continue funding these programs as we've heard from some stories and we'll hear more this is really impactful from our community one thing that we've been able to do from extending on this work from the mitigation fund and action for equity is we were able to learn more about what it takes for folks to find jobs and get to into public jobs and what training was needed and we were recently funded by mass clean energy center to do a workforce development program in another industry the green industry but in hvac refrigeration and um, energy auditor. And that's all due to the work that we learned from the funding that came from the mitigation fund, which allowed us to get other funding to continue and open up other opportunities in the community. So I want to again thank you all and thank you for the work that you do. And we want to make sure that this continues to happen in our communities. And next up is Stephen Hunter, UCSB, <coughs> you all for today. So welcome, Stephen. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, our, our partners in uh, uh, Mass Hire Metro North, uh, Mass Hire Boston uh, downtown, and our community friends. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces and friends out here today. Uh, it's an honor to be here. My name is Steve Hunter. I'm the Director of Adult Education at BCNC, uh, the Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Center. Uh, BCNC proudly serves greater Boston's Asian and immigrant communities since 1969. And we continue to empower over 13,000 individuals each year through education, family support, arts, and stronger communities by offering opportunities that help our participants achieve economic self-sufficiency. One of the key programs at BCNC is Customer First. That stands for Customer Focused Industry Recognized um, uh, uh, Retail Service Training. <clears throat> it's a training initiative designed to help immigrants and English language learners build careers in customer service industries. Uh, the Customer First program, which is funded in part by the Community Mitigation Fund uh, through Mass Hire Metro North, serves as a pathway for intermediate advanced English learners to gain essential skills for full-time employment and customer-facing roles. Uh, through this program, participants not only build customer service and computer skills, but also receive job assistance, interview practice, and exam preparation for industry-recognized uh, in, and industry-recognized uh, certification. We know that these opportunities are life-changing. Graduates of Customer First have gone on to secure positions in hospitals, retail, hospitality, and other service industries across the region. We have a number of employers um, where our students have gained employment, and of course, we've got re recent, um, recent placements at Encore uh, Harbor Casino. <clears throat> This training is not just about getting a job. It's about empowering participants to take their first steps toward long-term career growth here in the U.S. Our students are part of a larger effort to build a more resilient and inclusive workforce, a workforce that is essential to the revitalization of the hospitality sector, as others have mentioned. The Community Mitigation Fund has been instrumental in making all of this possible. The fund has played a critical role in providing vulnerable populations with the tools that they need to thrive. Through this support, 31 immigrants have enrolled in our training program, 30 have graduated, an impressive 97% completion rate, 40, uh, sorry, 74% of whom have gotten jobs, and currently, seven of our students are learning and working toward placement in uh, full-time living wage jobs. In closing, I'd like to emphasize the importance of continued investment in workforce development programs. This funding is vital to ensure our, that organizations like BCNC and others that are here today can keep providing essential services to our communities, enabling more residents to access high-quality jobs 
in supporting the overall growth of the economy. I want to thank uh, the Customer First team, many of whom are here. Uh, Nicole Smith, our Assistant Director of Workforce Initiatives. Kimberly Grace, our employment, our Employer Specialist. Uh, Olivia, Olivia Kurtoy, our ESOL and Workforce Instructor, who you saw today. Um, and of course, Ben Hires, our CEO of uh, BCNC. Uh, thank you, Commissioners, um, for your time today and for your ongoing support of our program and programs like BCNC's Customer First. We look forward to continuing our partnership and expanding the impact of this work. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Christina Picard. She's an employment specialist for Community Workshops. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, I am filling in today for Greg Kaplitz. I'm not Greg, I'm Christina. <laughs> um, for inviting us and having us. Um, I'm here from Community Work Services, uh, which was founded in 1877, has a long history of successfully supporting the vulnerable, group, vulnerable groups with barriers to employment, including people um, coming out of incarceration, homelessness, substance abuse, veterans, immigrants, and people with disabilities. All programs are provided free of cost, and CWS serves an estimated 800 individuals per year. All participants are low income and ages 18 and up. Participants are from the Boston and Greater Boston area. Participants speak all languages, uh, mainly Spanish, Portuguese, and Haitian Creole. Referrals are through all of our local nonprofit organizations, community governments, uh, community groups, government agencies, and word of mouth. Skill-based trainings include our hotel and hospitality and culinary arts programs. Um, CWS has received industry honors uh, for its training programs, and participants can obtain national industry-recognized uh, credentials, including the Association of Hotel and Lodging Educational Institute certification, ServeSafe allergen and uh, food handlers uh, certifications, OSHA as well. Um, these programs provide a combination of classroom learning and hands-on training to help participants develop the skills needed to become successful in the workplace. Twelve months of case management and career coaching are provided to ensure participants have the support needed to uh, meet their goals. Uh, CWAS uh, operates social enterprise businesses that provide transitional jobs to graduates, such as catering events, trash, and snow removal in and around our location on Portland Street, on the TV Garden. Um, and lastly, CWS is part of the FedCap Group, which is a global network of top-tier nonprofit agencies. Thank you very much for your time. Now we'll hear from IIME Cubana. Uh, Alexis and he is our host today. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning once again. Uh, of course, I hope you enjoy the tour, and we are happy to host you, and I'll host you when you come back. My name is Kuwana, I'm the Associate Director of Workforce Initiatives, I work at the International School of Migra, and we serve refugees and immigrants. Uh, currently, we are serving over 15,000 refugees and immigrants from across more than 10 nations. Actually, I'm coming here today to talk about the training program that um, through mass hire Again, the Commission as a mitigation fund uh, we give support with. So, before COVID, uh, we were really doing well with the, our, our hostage training program, and we were not planning to give job shadowing behind a lot of the connections, and then COVID came. And when it came, we were like, oh, what's going on? We have no training program, what is uh, causing? And uh, after, we, we got an opportunity for uh, mass hire, a call for proposal for the mitigation fund. And we sat down with the whole team of our and what are we going to do that is different? Hostel training, yes, we have been doing it for over 20 years. We have mastered it. What else can we change? And we came up with this name, Red, Set, and Sun. Simply because people were coming out of COVID, there was no more out of working, and everything was a little bit scattered. And we're like, okay, so we have been doing hostel training, this name set and service for uh, customer service related. What else can we add on in this training apart from job readiness? Talking about interview, resumes, communication skills, problem solving, and things like that. We say that we should add in such, some certifications that we realize when we are placing individuals that people can 
one of the certification is CPR. We all, for, of course, know we need that certificate in one way or another to save our lives and also to work. We also realize that we need another certification called OSHA, Occupational Safety Hazard, because they used to request it, they used to require it. So we are courageous enough to put up a proposal together and, of course, through seeing the tenure increase, they approved it while, oh, we are ready to go. And we found it interesting because it was general, because we were not really focusing on working only in the hotel, but it was for customer service related. And of course, the target was to work with our own Boston Harbor, of which we have a wonderful partnership since they opened June 2019. But also we wanted everyone to feel free to make sure that they know okay. I can even work remotely using this certification. I'm proud to say that uh, over 50 individuals that we have trained, 95% have completed the program. The attendance rate was around 98%. And the job placement rate is at 75%. However, we also track the retention. However much we are obliged to, to track the uh, retention at maybe 30 days, we go beyond 30 days. We go up to 180 days. And uh, the intention is at 90%, which is really uh, unbelievable. So, we want to thank our partners, uh, of course, and Paul Boston Harbor, because they come to the classrooms to speak to the students as guest speakers, but also they have that they give us enough room to take our clients for informational interviews with them, and some people are hired on spot. Uh, I also want to thank. The, the mitigation fund the beginning commissioner because of allowing us to get this fund. The only important thing I want to emphasize is that we incorporated stipend <laughs> into it because we realized that we are training these clients, but again, someone spending two, three, four hours coming for seven weeks. And at the end of all, they get that certification. There's no motivation fund for that. We realize that you know, they switch a bit. And of course, through mass hire, we pledged for, I mean, we, we advocated for the stipend. And this program had stipend of $1,300, which is really a game changer. And I want to call upon the game commissioners and also the whole team and the mitigation fund that, please, if we are writing these proposals, allow us to have that uh, allocation fund for stipend because it's a game changer for our programs, but also it's a game changer for the clients that we serve. Thank you so much, and we have to have Thank you, Sana. And now we'll hear from Law Collaborative, Carlos Galvez, Director of Economic Sustainability and Social Security. Hello. I was telling my friend uh, Kuwama that I am thrilled to be here this morning. This is my alma mater. I was a student at the International Institute of New England for ESOL, and I hope not to disappoint you with my with my English. <laughs> uh, I'm Carlos Galvez. And, uh, when I was a student at the International Institute of New England, I was also a at the same time a volunteer in um, a food distribution in a food pantry in a very well known organization in Chelsea. And now I'm the uh, director of economic sustainability, and, and I'm trying to have this opportunity to share what we are doing uh, in Chelsea and serving our residents of Chelsea ever review this possible. At La Colaborativa, we understood that the Community Mitigation Fund is a great opportunity to build a long term synergy between high impact business projects, like Alcor, impacted underserved communities and non-profits emanating out of the community. We are the community. With the purpose of better serving our Latinx and Caribbean community and focusing on empowerment, which means give them the tools and instruments to take the lead on their personal and professional lives with full understanding of their rights and opportunity. Just a couple of years ago, with the great challenge of integrating our community that community that worked outside in person during the whole pandemic to the new system and normality. We were working uh, a basic job in the service. Now, we probably say that in just the last few years, we have provided services to 3,648 residents of the Boston Metro North area for job readiness, economic development, and familial sustainability. 
that's the backbone and the core of our economic mobility efforts. They come to La Colaborativa and to our organizations every day for resources, for tools, for information, not for gifts, to connect with uh, mobility efforts, to have access to technology, to learn how to successfully pass an important process. We build those bridges that connect daily our community to where the opportunities are. We build those stubborn bridges, sometimes uh, Ted Williams Tunnels to opportunities. <laughs> Just the last quarter, April, June 2024, 360 community members benefited from the Job Readiness and Rapid Employment Program just in one quarter at our Survival Center and Economic Development Center. 280 community members attended one, attended one of our 38 Job Readiness Workshops in that quarter, um, primarily in Spanish, but also in Haitian Creole. From March 2023 to date, we have served uh, 1,128 community members in resume creation, held 77 workshops for job readiness, and supported 569 community members through job application and rapid employment appointments to connect with companies. We can probably say that we have served 311 residents in finding jobs just in 2024 through our coaching workshops, Job First, including the last one in the spring, this is spring, in which not even our biggest building was able to host at the same time 600 attendees who came looking for a job. Wish you were there. Yeah. Uh, looking for a job, for an opportunity to be seen, to be considered. Many people needed to wait in line outside to be able to get in, in the rain. No one left, they waited. And we were, they were persistent and patient. Our team was also outside with them providing refreshments and uh, just being astonished by, by this commitment of our community members. They were patient, patient because they know and we know that patience is the key. Patience is the key to achieve results and success. Our community members, the first and the last ones on every train in Boston area at 5, at 5 a.m. and after midnight work mainly in the hospitality industry food service and production, maintenance and construction, all elemental areas that are involved in the operation of a small family-run business, but also the biggest business, like Casino, like Anchor Casino. In order to be hired and be seen by these companies, it is necessary to develop skills, to get them certification, licenses, knowledge, empowerment, and finally, we are there. This month, we are launching our first aid back in our training program that pursues to cover employer, employers' need on green jobs and clean energy. As we learn from Anchor Casino about their urgent, or urgent need of qualified technicians who stay in the company. We want those jobs. We are getting ready. That's the importance of supporting the foundation of every mid-term project and long-term project. This is not just from one day to another. More than 300 students learning contextualized ESOL in the last uh, year with us, over 100 computer uh, classes, students, and served uh, 234 community members with services related to access to technology. But we need to continue this effort. It is not enough. They told us not to bring visuals, but thankfully there's a map. <laughs> <laughs> we serve Chelsea, Everett, maybe that area to the north. But we are based in Chelsea. What is happening in every day is we try to connect community members to the opportunities here with the better jobs are for some reason. <laughs> Many community members are afraid to cross these rivers because they are not going to be seen, they are not going to be understood, they are not going to be considered for opportunities for many, many, many reasons, whether we share them or not. And meanwhile, that we are empowering people and getting trained people, just this year, we are going to finish 2024 with more than 200 people trained in CPR, um, with OSHAs, confined spaces, uh, lockout, out. Meanwhile, we are trying to get them jobs and integrate a whole community here. They have been pushed up north because of the gentrification. So there's a lot of things to do right now. Um, so that's what we do. Uh, we uh, offer these services for job readiness, for career exploration, with appreciation, and solidarity, and the belief that everyone deserves a chance 
to be supported, especially in a hostile system sometimes that the labor market, labor market tends to be. Thank you. Let's see, I think uh, Barbara Johnson is going to be representing Nikia, New England Culinary Arts Street. Come on down. Good morning, everyone. I'm Barbara Black Johnson from NICAT. I'm the development director, and I named this grant. And I want to first say how incredibly thankful we are to Mass Iron Metro Miller, to Encore, and to the Gaming Commission for making these funds available to us. Um, NICAT is a tuition free 14 week culinary arts job training program. We provide the professional culinary training, a wellness curriculum that includes self care and mindfulness, and a career readiness component that includes digital and financial literacy um, and a conflict resolution and workshops to help prepare people to not just get the job but to deal with issues that arise once they have the job so that they can maintain them and keep them there. We offer training um, in three locations. Our Boston Center, which is located at 23 Bradston Street in the Massa Cass neighborhood. Uh, we have a lot of folks who come to that program walking on foot who are um, at shelters or sober houses nearby. We also offer a program behind the walls at Suffolk County House of Correction. Um, through their reentry program, we're training people who, in fact, we have a graduation going on right now. <laughs> or else our executive director would be here with all of you. But we have a class graduating there this morning, and it's folks who are close to being released. Um, and once they are released, they come back to NECAT or just down the street from them and um, start working on um, working their first interviews. We also um, have a program at the East Boston Y in partnership with the Greater Boston YMCA that is uh, taught in Spanish with an ESOL program. Um, we originally applied for this funding uh, for that program in East Boston to support an additional co cohort with the Y, but when um, due to scheduling that wasn't necessary, and at the same time, we were um, being flooded with requests from recent arrivals from Haiti to join the program, and we couldn't accommodate them because our deep program was in English, and you had to have a certain level of English proficiency to participate. We reached out to our partners, and we had already applied for the second year of the grant to do two cohorts of training and start a Haitian Creole culinary program, and they allowed us to pivot and um, our team, who uh, our instructor who worked in East Boston and a former NECAD graduate who now is a successful catering uh, business owner and about to open her first restaurant, who's from Haiti, agreed to come in and take, teach the program. So she underwent about a month of training at NECAD to become a culinary instructor. She was already teaching cooking classes elsewhere in Boston. And uh, before we knew it, we had uh, 20 people enrolled in a pilot program and launched it in April. Um, it was incredibly successful for the folks who were in that program. Um, we were uh, 17 graduated. Um, of those who stayed here in Boston, 70% of them are working at documented jobs. And um, many who were in shelters have since been able to move out. One of the reasons that um, we moved this project along as quickly as we did is we were hearing from folks that they were already on the list for permanent housing, but they had to have verifiable, verifiable um, full-time employment to keep their name on the list and to find a certain date. So we were originally planning to start our first cohort in July, um, and by having the flexibility to start in April, that got those 17 folks out and kept them moving for housing, and it's been really exciting to see uh, where they've landed and where they're working. Working, um, medical institutions, um, educational institutions, uh, restaurants, catering, um, special event companies. Our, uh, our chef instructor has hired a couple for her growing business too, so we see them all the time that we can. We're in uh, just about halfway through our second cohort of 19 adults, our third cohort, which is also fun to work this great this fall, and we have a waiting list for folks who would like to continue for a cohort that we don't yet have funding for, and uh, we'll hope to. 
Um, it has been um, incredible to add this community to NECAT. We run our program nine to three every day, and then we, we jokingly call it NECAT at night. We, uh, we clean everything up and we start again at four when our Haitian Creole, we do a, a lineup every morning with all the staff and students, and then we do a second lineup at four o'clock every day. And uh, it's been a wonderful community. In fact, our we have an annual fundraiser, which is next Thursday, if anyone's interested in this <laughs> um, And this year, we're leaning into um, the uh, Caribbean Latin fusion menu, reflecting the, uh, the talents of our chefs in East Boston and um, in the Nation Creole program. So it has added value for the folks in the program. It has added value to the students who are in the regular day program and the alumni community and our employer community. Um, it's really been an amazing, amazing process to see it come together this quickly, and none of it would have been possible if this community education fund money wasn't available to us. And the need is still there; it's growing. I would say four to five people a day will show up at our center. Um, recent arrivals from Haiti were now running info sessions in Haitian Creole and printing our materials in Haitian Creole. And our goal is to keep the program um, running. And um, we service about 180 adults a year in our program, um, most with major barriers to employment, um, almost half of our experience prior incarceration, um, you know, about a quarter experiencing homelessness and recovery. So um, that's why we have the wraparound supports that we have in our wellness program here and our career readiness program. And um, we look forward to continuing this and truly from the bottom of my heart. We can't we can't thank you well enough, Uncle and, and all the partners for making this program possible for us and for our participants. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we're gonna hear from Renee Taylor from some of the community organizations. Good morning. Good morning. So sitting up there having my flashback of being married to a pastor, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I was actually in the other building. I was like, what do you mean they're already going? So um, I am not the CEO. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Gonzalo Quibo is actually out on a, a personal mission, people say, and um, he asked me to pitch it for him. I don't have a lot of the CEO info that a lot of CEOs have. I have all the info on what we do kind of in the trenches. So I am the director of community programs at Seven Road Community Corporation. We've been there over 50 years. We're in Union Square. And what we do at First Source, which is the piece that we lovingly partner with you guys. Um, this woman is a gem. <laughs> She's just a gem. We brought her on yes. <laughs> It's the contact at the grant that really kind of makes it or breaks it for me. Um, so what we do is we work with anyone from anywhere. And it doesn't matter whether you are a documented, undocumented, high school education, no education, college education, you want to work at Harvard, you want to work at McDonald's, it doesn't matter. People come in and they're like, I need help with my resume. Or I've got a great resume, but I freeze up when I need to interview with someone. And so we have a program where people can come into a basic program where they're like, I just need my resume work, and I need a job, and I need it now. And we work with them to get them that job. Or people are like, you know what, I want to go to the whole program. The whole program allows them to work on resumes, work on elevator pitches, work on interviews, work on emailing, you know, when you're starting a job, what you do when you get a job online, how to apply online, and for people who come in and they're like, oh, I'm shaky on my computer skills, we just, through the ARPA grant, were able to start our own little computer lab so they can work with Kai, my computer coordinator, and figure out what it is they really need to know to be able to do the digital piece of the job because that's where we all go, right? So it was interesting to see how many people were like, oh, I can do it on my phone. I'm of an age where you can do everything on your phone. So we teach laptop as well as the basics of Outlook and Excel and PowerPoint and Word. And so we'll have a person come in and go through the program and start to kind of open themselves up to our coaches. Now we do a lot of work, but we've got 
I knew three amazing people. Um, I have Athena, who is my coach. My That's my only female coach right now, who speaks English. I have Olsen, who speaks Haitian, Creole, French, and Spanish. And then I have a brand new three-week gold um, coach who speaks uh, Spanish, but mainly Haitian, Creole. And what they do is work through their issues, right? Your coach is kind of reminds you of high school. You can do it. And that's what we do. We coach them through it. Last oh God, last year, we started our women's empowerment group, so an art program. And this was simply because Athena was like, I'm having women come in, and they don't feel like we can do this. But Athena has a, she's got a, like a crew of women that she's had for decades that support her no matter what. And she was like, we need to do this. And I said, write it. We'll find money for it. Let's go figure it out. And we graduated 27 women from three cohorts who have gone back to work, who have gone back to school, and they left truly empowered. And so it's the money that we get from these type of grants that allows us to do this work. The work that is kind of behind the curtains, where you just see all of a sudden this, this person coming up and be like, yes, I did it. And because of these stores, we have a bell in the office. And so as soon as we hear that someone got a job, you gotta come in, you gotta ring the bell. <laughs> Everybody stops what they're doing. They come out of their offices and they're like, what's going on? My client got a job, I got a job, I got a house, whatever it is. So that's what we do. We are small, but we are mighty. And we all have a heart for this business. It is why we get up in the morning. It is why we kind of pull our hair out at the end of the morning course. It's just what we do. So we thank you. I thank you on behalf of my staff and on behalf of Gonzalo for all that you've done to this point and hopefully all you Thank you. Thank you. Last but not least, we're going to hear from Jones for Here he is. No, no, no. no, no, no. I'm YMCA Great Boss. Hi, Jones. Hello. <laughs> Uh, going last, I get to now. I get some tricks. I know I have some. <laughs> I'm just going to talk a little bit about how these funds uh, really transform the way that we work at the YMCA of Greater Boston's Education and Training Center, and then how we can continue to, you know, look toward the future and really grow this program. And it's been really incredible and change, really how we do business. And you know, the YMCA of Greater Boston has an education and training center that provides English as a second language for adults right here in downtown Boston. <laughs> Adults uh, you know, are coming to learn English, and also we have a center in Woburn. Uh, we've been doing that since 1975. We've also been doing job training in this same location down in the vault since 1984 for English speakers um, you know, that are funded by vouchers. And during this global pandemic, it really forced us to think about how do we do things differently. Many of the ways that we had done things had to change, uh, not just because of the pandemic, um, and at the same time, um, we had systems that funded us and systems that we created that really put us in silos and, and made it difficult for that to happen. And this is really where um, we went through a strategic planning process and our goal was to really start to integrate our workforce development and our adult education into a common integrated contextualized program. And at the same time, meet people where they're at in their community, right? Not necessarily having them come down to a downtown community they might be um, afraid of or unable to come to. And um, this really sparked that innovation. This funding allowed us to partner with NECAT and start a contextualized culinary arts training program in the East Boston YMCA. So we partnered with the East Boston Y, we partnered with NECAT, we partnered with Metro North and Math Gaming and, and the funding that we received to really innovate and incubate this contextualized program where people were learning not just culinary arts and receiving serve safe certification in their native language, Spanish, but they were also learning English where we were having English instructors come out uh, and teach English and we've been running that in cycles in partnership with NECAT and we keep getting better and we keep you know improving every cycle and learning as well and with the funding as well um, it allowed us to see that we had a similar need in Woburn um, however we had no programming like that because we didn't necessarily have funders um, although the desire was there and we even had a kitchen a training kitchen in our Woburn 
uh, Methodist Church where we operate our adult learning. So we were able to, uh, with this funding, grow the program, uh, partner with our training partner, uh, Aspire Training and Development, and really launch another contextualized culinary arts training program in the Woodburn uh, Methodist Church. And in that area, we were uh, really seeing also an increased influx of uh, families that were new to the country, living in hotels surrounded in Woodburn. And, um, you know, many of them uh, were Haitian and wanted to participate in our job training program and getting to our program. Uh, the further you go out on the map, uh, transportation becomes much more difficult. Uh, so we were able to get support from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to be able to provide Uber shuttles from the hotel to the culinary arts training program where people could learn and get in, in Haitian Creole, the, how to, you know, pass the service certification, gain all the culinary arts training, and then also learning English um, on site at the Uber Methodist Church while we were supporting them with RISE. And that's um, also a program that's continuing to grow. Um, and we're really just excited about it. It's really um, allowed us to, again, change the way we do business, go into the community, provide integrated job training program. And then the last piece I'll say is that now uh, state systems and other of our funders, I think, are starting to catch up and starting to really uh, fund this work now. And you know, we have received additional funding that I think will help us sustain this work and grow it. This has been uh, incredible to even get us to this point. We wouldn't have gotten to this point without it, but now it's also coming on us to really figure out, you know, how do we sustain and leverage all the other public dollars that can really help us sustain and grow this, and that's really what uh, we're working with. And I just wanted to say thank you as well for all your belief in how we innovate and uh, how we can operate. I think that's been so incredible. And sometimes we operate in systems that have all these bureaucratic red tape, and we can't be as responsive. And being able to, you know, work with you, saying and have your belief and empowerment to do what's right, I think is why we're seeing so much results, and why uh, we're excited to be up here and to say thank you. And, and we hope you continue to invest in this incredible community. <laughs> Um, I just would like to say that I work with all these classes on a regular basis, and the work they do is incredibly amazing. Um, it's always, I'm always in awe of how hard they work and how dedicated they are to it. And community mitigation fund makes them fantastic. Plus, they all think I'm a uh, someone left their phone up here. Probably me. Don't get <laughs> shot. Yeah, I need my glasses. I need everything. That's right. Is that line or something? So listen, that was, that was there's some powerful information. And the thing I was sitting there thinking the whole time is, can we all agree D.C. is broke, but yep. Boston and Massachusetts is not? Yeah, that's right. That's what I heard yeah. while we were sitting up here. Um, and so we're going to the next item on the agenda. I hate to be the formal guy in the room, but <laughs> alas, it's my job. Um, and we're going to do discussions and questions, and the commissioners can feel free to join me up here or sit or whatever you want to do. Um, uh, but it will allow us to at least... Um, to discuss and have some questions. I'll start us off with saying, Carlos, you said the word synergies, which is a perfect word for what I think is going on here. Because we gotta think about the end user. We gotta think who's benefiting from this, not just whose territory is what, who gets the credit for what, who can say we did this. That's all BS, it's all baloney. What we have to talk about is how can we actually make these dollars impact each other? And how can we combine together to make sure that people get the best use of these funds? And so what I heard today was is synergies. And that's exactly right. That's what we're trying to do at the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. That's what the legislature, I think, intended with this fund uh, when they first passed it. And I am happy uh, to take the money from our licensees and put it towards programs like this. So uh, with that said, commissioners, Comments, questions? I, I have a comment, um, just a couple quick comments. So thank you all for being here. First off, stand up to my hat. <laughs> thank you all for being here. Um, I just, um, I, I want to express my appreciation for every single one of you and what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. If it weren't for you, um, these participants' futures might not be as bright. And so just, you should also feel proud of the work that you do to contribute to this space. Um, it's just a fantastic opportunity for us to come here and, and, and hear 
um, the success and see the success behind uh, the work that you do, um, the words that are on the papers that we review, the grant applications that our team reviews, and, and as they're coming before us to deliberate, um, it's really good to just get a personal, some personal insight into the work that you do. Um, to the young lady here, I, your name is escaping me, I'm sorry, so, but so Lily, yes, congratulations yes. to you and your husband. Keep climbing. I hope you get that home that you're aspiring to. Um, you're definitely in the right place, obviously, and it's really good to, to see live and in person um, one of the one of the very beautiful success stories. And it only took a year to get where you are. So imagine. I don't think we've seen anything yet. So <laughs> thank you to you all. <laughs> uh, I mean, Ryan, I'm one of the other commissioners here. Uh, thank you very much. I know, in addition to telling your story, the time that you took out of what I'm sure is a very underfunded and overworked day to come in and talk to us. And so we really appreciate it. And to echo what Commissioner Sanders said and, and what Chair Maynard had said, and what I'm sure Commissioner Hill will say as well, which is, you know, we. We joke that we see you through boxes, and that's sort of how we are viewed, and we get to see you. And it can be a very isolating job. I'm going to be selfish in what I say right now. And this is the part that really energizes me, going out, even you know, the horse racing community that we get to see and see what's really behind this. This, to me, is really what humanizes this job, right? And you talk about a job's creation, both for the casinos and what that means, and to hear your um, you know, unbelievable English that has come out of these programs and the success and the jobs that you've had um, is empowering for us as well. And the team does a lot of work to go through these grants and we really try to be creative and how can we get this money out in the most impactful way. You guys are the ones on the front lines actually doing that. Um, but this energizes us and our team too to come up with ways of, well, how can we get more money out there? The programs that are really working. And so selfishly, I say thank you because this is energized me. Um, and then also, again, thank you to all that you do. Um, again, underfunded and understaffed and overworked, but um, unbelievable work and, and just really great to hear today. When I was in the legislature, I always spoke last, and all I would have to say is, ditto, because it's already been said, and I would get a standing ovation for that. Uh, so I, I'll say ditto to everything that's already been said, but more importantly, I want to say thank you for the work that you do. And I'm going to uh, point out to our team here, we keep saying the word team, but it's Mary, it's Lily, it's Joe, who work uh, with Mass Hire. And I'm glad we were able to put a, a, you know two faces together. You see everybody in a box, and today you got to meet the first one. Uh, the work that gets done. These are competitive grants, and they put in a lot of hours to see who should be getting these grants. When I was in the legislature, I voted for 23K, and this is exactly where we thought the funds should be going. So for me to now be on a regulatory board and see that those funds are going to where we had hoped they would go firsthand, I'm very proud to say that we did the right thing in the legislature, but more importantly, you folks are doing the work that we hoped and intended that these funds would go to. So thank you for that. Thank you to our team. Thanks for having us here today. Um, it's so important for us to get out and see these things firsthand. Uh, we're hoping to do a lot more of that. Uh, you folks are our first trip in over a year to see our community develop our, our community mitigation funds and where they go. And I couldn't have asked for a better host and uh, a better discussion that we've had today. And to you, <laughs> I am deaf as a hatter, so I can't understand things totally. I understood you perfectly. <laughs> so you're English? Uh, and congratulations, and for you to come before us today probably was not the easiest thing to do, and to speak in front of people like this, but you did great, and you put a face on exactly uh, where these funds go, and we appreciate you taking time out to come talk to us, and all of you today. Thank you. Can I ask the one question, and anybody can answer it if they want to. What can we do? What can we do to help? 
and, and what can we do uh, to continue to help impact this? So I asked that question looking for that answer. So I'm so glad I didn't plan it. I didn't plan it. Thank you, Mary. I knew Louise would ask it. I was afraid. I, I, I didn't even plan that one, did I? Um, so, you know, uh, it's tough um, to be in state government, right? And it's tough for the legislators and the governor to do their jobs. And they had to make a priority this year that reallocated some of these funds. Um, we had enough money left over to continue the program for this year. Um, but if you're so inclined and think that these funds are of good use, you should express yourself to those who represent you. That's how I'll say it. Um, and um, so with that, um, I think that's all we have. Anybody have anything else? Anybody want to say anything? I'll move forward. Carlos. I, I think it's very important to bring visibility to the things that we do. Uh, because it's very easy to speak up and to say we're doing this, this and that, but also you're more than welcome to come anytime to any of our organizations to, to experience um, like how the opportunity, how the, to experience this work with the, with the community members, with the people that we serve. Um, the poor, and, and, and I love that we are here because it's very important to see that this is the people that we are serving. We are all serving. Like sometimes, uh, I, I have trouble to to event like uh, process uh, the situation where we are doing this amazing stuff with out of the gaming situation, but um, it, it, it's 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 kind of checks and balance, and and, and 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 we are helping a lot of people to to have opportunities and and. and the opportunity to dream and the opportunity to achieve um, the, the, the goals that they have. But I, I would say this is better. Like, um, let's let's um, recognize uh, the job that each one of us are doing. And the other thing is, yeah, definitely funding because it's like so frustrating that meanwhile you are on the on the on the battle uh, on the battleground and you are working like very hard every day uh, to serve people with the, the short resources that you have. You are kind of concerned is are, are we going to be able to to keep this to afford this? My is my team is going to be able to continue working with us like next year and two years? Like like that is very hard even for the people who are helping us to to create this uh, synergy. So um, if there's a way that we can also collaborate to strengthen uh, the the resources and to convince who I mean whoever uh, wants to. Change uh, this perspective, um, contrary to positively increasing the, the resources, uh, we are more than, than able to cooperate in time. All right, with that, <laughs> that's a good way to end that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have anything? All right. Um, you know, I will say, Commissioner Hill, you made me think, Barbara. Commissioner Hill does um, love to go do night visits at Encore, so maybe NECAD at night is for you, Commissioner. So with that, uh, do we have any food as well? No, no. It's always really good. So do we have, uh, let's do one more thing before we close this up. We did print out uh, a little certificate just of our appreciation. Um, I, I would like to invite Chris up uh, and whoever else would like to pick up. Yeah, can, I, can I have the representatives of the partners come up with yeah. me? Yeah, this is just recognizing. Yeah. 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 It's just something you guys can show off in the earth. <laughs> so this is really a recognition of all the partners behind me and the work that they do. So great work, everybody. So you can replace that picture of me on your desk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Now, you do have to do one piece of business, which is awkward. Uh, any other business? Move to her. Um, all in favor, aye. 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 Aye.